All right. Well, welcome everyone to the AMSSM Medical Student Interest Groups webinar. My name is Nick Hadamia. I'm currently the Vice President of the Medical Student Interest Group. And today we have uh, two great speakers to talk about the Olympic and Paralympic Games, specifically talking about the role of the sports medicine physician. And our first speaker is going to be Dr. Cruz. Uh, Dr. David Cruz is a board certified physician in both family medicine and sports mm -hmm. medicine. He currently practices within a large multi-specialty orthopedic group while also serving as a team physician for multiple high schools, colleges, and sports teams. He has been a team physician for USA Gymnastics for the last eight years and recently accompanied them for the Rio, to Rio for the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. Dr. Cruz has a personal background in gymnastics, having been an All-American gymnast at UC Berkeley and a member of the USA Gymnastics national team for four years. He is also an associate faculty member with Long Beach Memorial Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship and has served on AMSSM's membership and fellowship committees. Dr. Cruz's talk is going to discuss the preparation that goes into traveling with the sports team and providing medical care on the road. He's also going to highlight experiences specifically from the 2016 Olympic Games. In this context, he'll also review the principles of proper event coverage and emergency protocols. And our second speaker is Dr. Sherry Blowett. She's an attending physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation and sports medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, where she also serves as a disability access and awareness director. She's a graduate of the Stanford University School of Medicine and completed her residency training at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Blowett also serves as the, oh, she was also a Paralympic athlete in the sport of wheelchair racing, competing for the United States teams in three Paralympic Games. Sydney, Athens, and Beijing, and she brought home a total of seven medals. She's a two-time winner of both the Boston and New York City Marathons and has been nominated for the SB Award and Women's Sports Foundation Athlete of the Year. Translating her background as an athlete into the clinical setting, Dr. Bowett now serves as a chairperson of the International Paralympic Committee's Medical Commission, as well as numerous other leadership roles throughout the Olympic and Paralympic movement. Dr. Blauet's talk is going to focus on perspectives of providing medical oversight in major events such as the Olympic and Paralympic Games, particularly pertaining to the athlete village and medical venue stations. Dr. Blauet will review the various roles and responsibilities that can be considered as areas of involvement and growth by young sports medicine clinicians. And so Dr. Cruz and Dr. Blauet will both give their presentations, and then we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Cruz. Great, thank you so much, Nick. And you can hear me okay, correct? Yes. Great. Well, I'm excited to be a part of this presentation and it certainly is a pleasure to uh, speak alongside uh, Dr. Pelouet. Uh, a lot of the fun things to uh, to talk about when it comes to event coverage, especially in the Olympic Games and, and uh, what goes into preparing for international competition as a uh, team physician. It really depends on where you're traveling to and, and uh, every place can be a little unique in our preparation. So it's nice to kind of dive into some of those details, but also just keep in mind general principles that you can try and apply to various places that you are traveling uh, based on the specifics of those locations. Of course, a lot of the motivation for uh, this talk has uh, come out of the Olympic Games. So it's always nice to kind of uh, take a step back and relive some of that and kind of give you some context for, for Rio and at least my my context and uh, personal experience and kind of fun to share some photos. But these are uh, general photos of the athlete uh, village. Um, upper left is just a, a picture of some of the uh, multiple apartment buildings where all the various countries um, stayed and, and, um, and were housed in the village. U.S. had a large enough delegation where we had the pleasure of having our own building, but a lot of other smaller countries and delegations would share buildings. Of course, a lot of this goes into the uh, medical preparation, too, that I'll talk to you a little bit later. Uh, the village did have a general exercise recreational facility for anybody staying in the village. Um, there was a lot of uh, general common areas as well. Uh, again, down here on the bottom left is a general pictorial view of, of the village in general and some of the surrounding uh, uh, areas uh, up along the, uh, the mountain side. This was uh, my team that, uh, that I got to uh, travel with, uh, team being a very broad term, but certainly the, the male gymnasts were uh, the teams I spent most of my time with, but I was there as a team doc for, for gymnastics in general. So 
uh, helped take care of the uh, women's artistic as well as T- TNT tumbling and trampoline athletes as well. We had a different uh, staff come in later on uh, to work with uh, the rhythmic team um, as well. So I spent most of my time with the guys team, a, a great group of guys and, and, and coaches. Uh, these were some of the venues uh, with uh, the Olympic Games and the main uh, area for uh, velodrome and, and tennis and uh, basketball and, and some of the other combat sports all were housed in these venues. Uh, and then uh, look across the uh, the river to the village in the background, as well as a lot of the training facilities that were used. And, and again, we'll talk about some of the specifics as it relates to the medical coverage. Uh, it's busy. It's 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 busy when you're there as a medical practitioner. You you really are there uh, to work and uh, and work a lot. Uh, the focus is is on that, and oftentimes it's it's uh, from from sun up to sundown. The last day, I did have an opportunity to go out and check out track and field, which was a pretty great venue. And uh, we did venture out to the beach uh, one time in the uh, three and a half weeks that I was there, and we were able to see some of the sites that way. But otherwise, it was pretty pretty focused on the athletes and our our job there. So in terms of uh, preparation for, for travel and when we're covering these uh, international events, there's a number of different things to keep in mind. One is, you know, what is your team? Who are the people that you're traveling with? Uh, do we need to prepare from a medical standpoint when it comes to vaccines or infectious disease? Um, that certainly came into play with, uh, with Rio on a couple different levels. What are your medical supplies that you plan on bringing? What are the medical conditions that you might need to prepare for? So when it comes to medical histories, that could be applicable to the athletes you're traveling with, but it could also be applicable to the staff, whether it's coaches, uh, other delegates, uh, judges, depending on the sport, other officials uh, that might be traveling with the U.S. delegation, you know, oftentimes you're going to be there to take care of everybody. So it's helpful to know what those medical histories are, especially in some of our um, older individuals who are traveling, such as the judge, and they may have uh, some medi- baseline medication management that they need to be consistent with or have um, other medical conditions that'll be important for you to be aware of as the traveling. If there are any athlete specific needs in terms of supplies, you know, whether somebody uh, tends to use a particular type of uh, tape or um, a particular type of anti-inflammatory medicine, it's important to uh, be very aware of and in tune of your athlete specific needs so that as a staff, you can make sure that you can be prepared and, and have everything for them that they that may, may need for that competition. And then, of course, weather, depending on the sport, comes into play, and then uh, doping control. And we'll talk more about some of these things as we go along. The uh, medical team, that could be, depending on the trip and the size of the event and the number of athletes uh, going and the host um, uh, country and their level of care that they are going to provide for you, uh, that could be the, the team physician, ATCs, PTs, massage therapists, um, uh, dietitians. You know, the list goes on in terms of what resources you may need. Now, at the Olympic Games, that's handled in a number of different ways. The U.S. Olympic Committee will travel uh, uh, a whole uh, medical staff in addition to what the NGBs will travel, an NGB being a national governing body such as USA Gymnastics, USA Track and Field, USA Swimming. Some of the bigger NGBs or delegations will have their own staff that travels, uh, but for some of the smaller sports or smaller delegations, the U.S. Olympic Committee, USOC, will have uh, medical staff and practitioners there to help care for them. Uh, But depending on what those resources are, it's going to be variable in terms of what you might travel with as as a team doctor. For gymnastics, um, I was the team physician. We had uh, ATCs that were assigned to um, each of the artistic disciplines. Uh, we cross-covered for tumbling and trampoline because they only had two athletes, and then the rhythmic team came in with their own ATC, who was also a DPT. So it, 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 it gets very specific when you start talking about the NGB level. Um, and then in addition to that, at the Olympic Games or any of these larger uh, IOC sponsored events, International Olympic Committee uh, will have their own medical coverage uh, requirements. So there'll be a mass clinic available and I'll show some pictures of that. 
um, or other medical facilities and practitioners that are available at the different competition and training venues. So it's important to be aware of all of those things when you're going in terms of who you might be traveling with and what your needs may be. Um, and then whoever is going, just being very clear in terms of what's going to be expected of, the, of those individuals. You know, I can tell you that as a team physician, if you're on um, an international trip where there's not many resources and you're traveling with a larger team and it's just you and an ATC, you might have to uh, be willing to work outside of your comfort zone a little bit, and do a little bit of massage, do a little bit of hands-on care, kind of uh, dive in there and, and get your get your hands dirty and uh, work as a team to to do whatever the the athletes need. So it's uh, it very much is a medical team in sports medicine. We always talk about that. Everybody kind of working together for the benefit of the athlete. So this was uh, again my team. Um, the uh, uh, individual pictured uh, with me here is the ATC that I've been working with the last uh, two or three years, specifically with the men's program. Um, so we have a really close, strong re working relationship. We know these guys really, really well. And uh, we traveled together to Rio. And uh, it was a pleasure to work with uh, Jamie, who's a long, long time, a very experienced ATC. And it was just a pleasure to um, have that uh, teammate alongside with me to uh, work with these athletes. So in terms of infectious disease, uh, there are certainly just general vaccinations that are important no matter where you're going, you know, that we would typically uh, have in the United States in terms of standard vaccine protocols. And then in terms of other recommended vaccines, it really depends on where you're going, what part of the world and what diseases are endemic to those areas, as well as uh, these can be uh, seasonal. So, you know, with, with uh, Brazil and um, the Olympic Games, of course, there was the Zika virus, uh, mosquito-borne illness that had a lot of attention, and um, that could be a whole nother lecture. If there's any questions at the end, we can talk about that, and Sherry, I'm sure, can have some some thoughts and her experiences with that, too. But um, depending on where you were in, in for the Olympic Games, actually, it varied in terms of what recommended vaccines or prophylaxis was, was uh, needed, because uh, with uh, the Rio Games, some of the venues were actually throughout the, the country and some were really back into the jungle. And those, uh, those teams and those athletes and individuals needed a certain um, spectrum of vaccination recommendations, whereas those that were more uh, isolated to the beach areas or to Rio proper um, didn't need as much vaccination. So it really is very geographic in terms of what's required. And um, when you travel to different areas and you're wondering what's going to be best for those athletes or for those teams, uh, there are a lot of great resources that you can refer to. Uh, the CDC is really one of the main ones that we, we go to. It has really good uh, endemic maps in terms of what uh, diseases are, are there and what vac vaccinations may be uh, required. And um, I, I often... Uh, reference this website uh, throughout the year whenever we have teams uh, traveling. I may not be going with them, but, you know, I, I certainly can help counsel them for that delegation um, on what vaccines they need to be looking at and making sure that they're prepared. So it's a uh, great resources with the CDC to kind of work through that. And there's other infectious disease prophylaxis between, you know, uh, um, uh, foodborne illnesses and other environmental exposures. You know, just the standard infectious protocols of washing hands, but um, water sources can be variable depending on where we are. Uh, what kind of meals are provided? Are they going to be catered? Are we going to be eating just out in the community? Uh, how are we going to be obtaining those uh, those meals can um, uh, factor into what prophylaxis and um, precautions that you might take. And, of course, um, you know, understanding that um, – Sometimes there can be exposure to STDs as well. Uh, this picture is actually a picture of the condoms that were provided uh, at the Olympic Games. There was a lot of talk about that going in with the Zika virus and, and how the IOC and Olympic committees were going to be handing out thousands of condoms. There was actually a condom dispenser in the cafeteria um, on your way in and out where, where anybody could pick up these exact um, condoms for prophylaxis, 
you could be eating anywhere in the cafeteria and you can hear that machine clicking. It was quite humorous. You could know when somebody is going up to grab a condom. Not quite um, um, in isolation, but uh, very readily accessible. The medical supplies that you may uh, bring on, on a particular trip also can be quite variable uh, depending on where you're going and what kind of resources are going to be available. In general, you know, in terms of, of always wanting to be as prepared as possible, oftentimes you just assume that nothing's going to be provided and you just make sure that you are as self-sufficient as possible and you have all of the essential things that you may need. And then when you get there, if, if it actually pans out that they have some of the things that um, were planned on, then that's great. And if not, then at least you're you're prepared. Again, at the Olympic Games, um, it's much more extensive, but sometimes when you're traveling to other international areas, depending on the sport and depending on the, the type of event, there may be nothing there for you. So self-sufficiency uh, is, is really, really important. And again, always keeping in mind uh, what those athlete specific needs may be uh, for a particular competition. Uh, this was just a couple pictures of all the bags that, that I took to Olympic Games. The upper left is um, uh, clothing supplies that actually became very minimal compared to all the medical supplies that you try to get there. Uh, this is just one picture in the middle there of my medical bag and some of the things that I brought to Rio in terms of, um, you know, small uh, side satchel, the main uh, medical bag, uh, different medication, prescription supplies that we might take, um, Ionto pads down here, uh, different types of uh, supplements um, that we might need to provide. You can see here suture equipment. So, you know, we try to really be self-sufficient as well as sport specific. This is a Cal Shaver for gymnasts, crazy glue for when they get uh, rips on their hands. And uh, you just try to bring as much as you can fit into one small bag and then try to fit that into a plane. So um, you uh, it, it can get quite extensive, especially when you're going on a three and a half to four week trip. For the uh, Olympic Games, uh, Brazil had us uh, fill out a customs manifesto of all the medical equipment that we were bringing in and out of the country. And this is just a picture of my manifesto that um, that I brought along and all the supplies that were required. So when, you, when you're talking about, again, what supplies you're going to bring, a lot of that has to do with what's going to be provided for you. Um, I mentioned in the village how we were, you know, um, thankful as a U.S. delegation to really have our own building, which meant that we could really take over that building when it came to uh, being prepared medically. And so uh, the USOC did a wonderful job in terms of setting up everything that we may need um, where we can work with these athletes. Um, in the in the uh, actual building, there was two separate zones for medical uh, treatment. There was a general medical uh, care facility where um, even as an NGB medical staff, we would have access to to treat our athletes if we didn't want to do that in their rooms. Um, so there was an actual medical zone, and then there was a whole separate recovery room where they had massage therapists. Uh, this is a picture of cold and hot plunges down here in the bottom right. They had a Norma Tech machines, game-ready machines, a lot of different recovery um, products and uh, modalities to, to help with our athletes. So we were, we were well-staffed, well-supplied, and it really had all the tools that we needed to you know, take care of the athletes as best we can. In terms of doping, uh, this is just an interesting thing that just kind of helps remind us that, you know, there definitely are going to be athletes out there that uh, will try to take advantage of the system. And um, if given the opportunity, they certainly uh, may look into it. Uh, at all of our major events, uh, especially with gymnastics, um, there usually is doping control, whether it's uh, domestic with, with USADA or uh, international with WADA. And certainly at the Olympic Games, that's a big, uh, a big presence. So with, with the doping, you know, there's just a number of things that you want to be prepared for, um, to help your athletes. You know, we want to assume that, that our personal athletes are clean and uh, we want to try to help be advocates for them. But a lot of that comes with education, education, education. So always being aware of what they're putting in their bodies, being aware of what that banned, uh, substance list is. Uh, being aware of how supplements can impact them, 
Um, and then as a medical staff, it's, it's our job to be aware of what medications they're on. Uh, they, they may, they may not be aware that, um, a medication is not banned or is banned, excuse me. And it's our job to, um, to help them identify that. Uh, and then if that is the case, if they are on a, a prescription medication, for a substance that is required for a medical condition, there are options and opportunities to do therapeutic use exemptions through the doping agencies, what we call TUEs. So if you have an athlete who has ADD and they're on a stimulant, um, they don't have to come off of that stimulant necessarily to compete in the Olympic Games, but but there definitely has to be pre-Olympic Games documentation and approval for them to use that um, so that if they do get tested and it does create a positive test, they're covered. And so it's important to make sure your athletes have what TUEs they may need uh, for you to be aware of those TUEs, to have copies of those TUEs so that you can provide all that documentation if they are um, tagged for, for testing um, so that you can uh, do those declarations. Um, with, with USA Gymnastics, we always have a medical staff member that actually goes into doping with our athletes when they are tagged for testing. Uh, just so we can be an advocate in case the athlete has a question about, um, you know, what, uh, uh, what, uh, medications that they're taking and, um, uh, in case they have questions about uh, supplements or over the counter medicines that they may have, uh, been, been using. Um, hey, hey, Nick. Yes. Um, my slides all of a sudden went away. Do you know how I can bring those back up? Um, not sure. Yeah, they went away from me as well. Let me take a look. Let's see. Good question. Um, Joan, if you're still there, if you could help out and possibly re-upload the files. It looks like for some reason it got closed. Let me take a look. Let's see. Did that work? Oh, that works. Okay. Excellent. All right. So um, basically, we serve as that athlete advocate, so to speak, to um, help them walk through that that um, that process of the doping and and just be there in case they um, get into a situation where they need somebody to uh, to help them through it. Um, and then just as a as a team doctor, just being aware that there are different levels of doping and different um, uh, uh, banned substance list depending on what institution or what agency you're talking about. USADA and WADA tend to be uh, along the, the same lines. NC2A uh, can be a little bit different or different uh, universities may have uh, internal institutional testing that they do and their uh, banned list may be different too. So uh, that's a lot to kind of be aware of as an athlete and sometimes they just don't understand the variances within that so again, um, as a team doctor, um, it's important for you to, to help be that um, that advocate. This is just a couple of pictures from the floor of the gymnastics arena. Uh, it was you know pretty neat just to kind of how all the the logos and the the environment and the atmosphere being on the floor of the Olympic Games um, with with um, the other staff and and uh, experiencing that um, at a ground level is just a special experience to be a part of. So travel, a couple quick notes on travel, and then we'll move move along to the second half. Uh, but with airline travel, you know, there's always that possibility of jet lag and different aspects that we need to be aware of in terms of the athletes and their performance. And that can be athlete to athlete, depending on their uh, anxiety levels with travel and their um, physiologic response to that. We do know that different athletes will respond to jet lag and travel differently. Uh, but those symptoms, you know, can be fatigue, uh, disruption in their sleep, energy, irritability, headache, concentration difficulties, decreased appetite. Of course, this spectrum of symptoms reminds us a lot of another type of condition, such as like a concussion. Um, so, we, you know, we can see these symptoms uh, in a lot of different clinical scenarios. Um, and just as a side note, um, just uh, three weeks ago, we had a team travel to Bolivia, 9,000 feet of elevation to, to compete in gymnastics. And so not only do they have jet lag, but they also have altitude sickness. 
and then a guy peeled off the high bar and landed on his head. So how do you tease out some of these symptoms that can come from various different clinical scenarios? Um, it, it can be difficult, but being aware that this symptom spectrum can occur is important as you move forward and, and try to help um, them transition into their training. Um, in terms of jet lag and athletic performance, you know, there really is no great study to show that it can impact, but at the same time, we do know that, uh, that it can be a factor and the U.S. Olympic Committee actually has comprehensive guidelines on how to counsel your athletes. So those are readily available online. Uh, different interventions that have been proposed for jet lag in terms of, um, sleep hygiene and, and sleep disruption. Uh, trying to slowly transition your sleep cycle to the time zone that you're traveling to, uh, avoiding heavy training on the first day or two, 24 hours of, of travel. You know, all these things are, are options as you try to adapt. Uh, dietary concerns can be, uh, again, variable depending on where you're going, but also just being aware of any athlete specific dietary concerns that, that may be involved. Um, at the event, you know, trying to maintain hydration can be difficult, uh, depending on where you are in the venue. Again, at the Olympic Games, uh, things were, were well, well supplied, so that wasn't as much of an issue. Uh, this was my last meal in the Olympic Village before coming home. And, uh, of course, coffee was readily available for everybody and, um, much needed at certain times. The scheduling of meals, depending on the travel schedule, depending on the training schedules, competition schedules can be difficult. You know, if you look at the uh, the swimming schedule in Rio, I mean, those the swimmers were competing at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, and so they had to completely shift their sleep and meal schedules uh, to their competition times. So it, uh, it it can be difficult at times to kind of work through that process. This is just a picture of the Olympic Village cafeteria. It was an enormous structure, feeding thousands of people at a time. But it was a, a pretty neat environment to be a part of, uh, seeing athletes from all over the world, um, just kind of intermingling with them. Uh, safety is always something to keep in mind, too. Uh, and, of course, the Olympic Games gets a lot of exposure for that. Uh, the Brazilian Army was everywhere. And, uh, in general, I felt pretty safe in, in my, my experience. And um, with our delegation, we were pretty, uh, pretty isolated to either the village or the uh, competition training venues. Um, in terms of competition, from a medical coverage standpoint, you know, you really are there 24-7 for the athletes to uh, provide a lot of different types of care, whether it's acute injury, uh, managing any chronic injuries that they may be coming in with, uh, any illnesses that may occur, uh, again, recovery services to make sure that those are accessible for the athletes and that you're helping your best to, uh, to accommodate those. And then uh, in terms of medical emergencies, you know, it's just like if you're going down the street to cover a high school football game or if you're going to the Olympic Games, you still come back to the same principles of uh, being aware of what your supplies are, being aware of what the emergency action plan is for where you're going and the venue that you're that you're uh, competing or training at. Uh, and then with the Olympic Games or any international um, uh, exposure, you know, you just need to be aware of what team is available there and uh and making sure that you get to know them as soon as you are on the ground so you, so if something like this occurs you're not introducing yourself as a team doctor um trying to uh wade through that acute um uh, response and emergency action plans if everything is reviewed beforehand things can go much more smoothly thankfully for the US team we didn't have any major injuries like this but this was a pretty well exposed um injury that did occur in gymnastics the olympic games I was standing right next to the to the vault landing when this happened, and unfortunately, this happens in gymnastics, um, and it's important for us to definitely have a very well-established emergency action plan no matter where we are. Um, and what I usually do is I look at that venue map and uh, know exactly where is the competition floor, where is the training hall, where is medical going to be, what's the extraction points, where is the ambulance going to be, where are the medical supplies, who's going to be on the floor and where they're going to be, who responds to what, all of those things are going to be important so things run smoothly when we have a, an acute event. Um, they, they did a great job in general in terms of having a lot of people staffed at the different venues. A lot of them were actually coming from America 
and and we're English speaking, so that wasn't too much of an issue. And this was a picture of that um, large uh, clinic that was available in the village for dental rehab, imaging, general medical services. Um, they had a lot of uh, services available through the IOC in the um, in the um, Olympic Village and at the different venues. I mentioned language barrier. Thankfully, at, in Rio, a lot of the volunteers uh, were very, very good at English or even English as their primary language, so that wasn't much of an issue. But uh, certain venues, that can be a big issue. And so making sure that you have a, a good awareness of what um, interpretive services are available and who you can go to to kind of help communicate, especially in an acute um, stage. So um, those are come, come, uh, some of my thoughts as it relates to uh, event coverage in general, but in, in the particular application to international competition and then uh, diving into some of the specifics of what I experienced in, in Rio. Uh, thankfully, we were able to wade our way through with just minor and expected aches and pains and, and minor injuries. And uh, we did have quite a lot of success, which was um, a lot of fun. And, and again, it was just um, a pleasure for me to be a part of it and uh, and uh, was a special experience. So I'll hand it off to, uh, to Sherry for the uh, second half. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. And um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Oh, my son. Great. Okay. So um, thanks very much for the invitation to join for this webinar. I think it's a really exciting topic. And I uh, appreciated um, Dr. Cruz's really thorough and really nice overview of his experience um, at the Olympic Games working with the gymnastics team. I thought I would present a little bit of a different perspective. So just to give some background, um, I currently practice in Boston um, and have been trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation as well as sports medicine. And um, competed through the 2000s and then, and then after I finished my competitive career, really wanted to, of course, you know, maintain involvement in the Olympic and Paralympic movement. And an opportunity came along that gave me a little bit of a different lens to do that through, and that was working with the International Paralympic Committee, which is more so um, providing oversight and thinking about the rules and policies that govern the game, specifically on the Paralympic side. So a few things I wanted to talk about include um, just a little bit about the Paralympic movement to provide some background about that a little bit about our experience in Rio, and then talking about our role as sports medicine physicians and the various things that we can do to stay and become involved with Olympic and Paralympic sport, both domestically as well as internationally, and then and then thinking about what's coming into the future um, with the PyeongChang Games in 2018, Tokyo 2020, and beyond, and who knows, maybe even Los Angeles in 2024 if all goes as is planned. So a brief introduction to the Paralympic movement, I think it's very important to note that this is an event for which uh, the profile continues to grow very rapidly. Um, the Paralympic Games kick off typically around seven to ten days after the Olympic Games. So in Rio, um, we had the closing of the closing ceremony of the Olympics, and then about, I believe it was about ten days later, the village opened again for the Paralympics, and our opening ceremonies took place shortly thereafter. So these days when a city bids for the Games, they bid for both the Olympics and Paralympics, and it's seen as sort of one package, um, but distinct event. So the Paralympic Games were said to have started back in the 40s, and initially these were, uh, you know, uh, started as a tool for rehabilitation for people with new disabilities that they experienced um, predominantly in World War II. However, only in about 60 to 70 years, this has really evolved into being an elite international sporting event in the recent Rio Games hosted over 4,000 athletes from 160 countries and um, we saw 220 world records broken. So moving out of the paradigm of rehabilitation and evolving into an elite sport event is really what we've seen in the last several decades and it's been very exciting to be to be a part of it both as an athlete and, and now as a, a physician. This is just a pictorial representation of the growth of athlete participation. Uh, the first official Paralympics were said to have been in uh, Rome in 1960, and then if you fast forward that to London and then most recently to Rio, you see that it's been a really rapid trajectory of growth. Um, also with that, we've seen a lot of um, increase in broadcast coverage and just awareness around what Paralympic sport is and um, the, the way in which it's 
you know, offers that similar playing field for elite athletes with disabilities. Um, and I show this just to show that it's been a several thousand percent increase over the last um, 10 to 15 years of international uh, broadcast coverage, um, particularly in, in, in parts of the world where, um, where you know, uh, the disability movement is a little bit more progressive, like here in the U.S., Canada, Australia, et cetera. Um, Sochi 2014 brought increased coverage in the U.S. So this is still something that's a big point of advocacy. You know, there's a lot of people that are involved in Paralympic sport, either as athletes or family or fans more generally, who still want to see it covered more on TV. And that's certainly a goal uh, moving forward. And um, prior to Sochi, there wasn't much at all. Um, after Sochi, they they were at, during Sochi, they um, had about 50 hours of coverage that was prominently on NBC Sport Network. And we started to see Paralympians being used more broadly and particularly marketing campaigns, and Rio had um, over 66 hours of coverage on NBC and NBC Sports Network. So still nowhere near um, where the Olympics is at, but um, something that's been growing uh, fairly remarkably. And I think here you see images of athletes that are that are pretty familiar and are becoming more regularly known throughout the sports world, such as Tatiana McFadden, who's a multi-marathon multi winner, and of course brought home um, a lot of medal from Rio as well. So despite, you know, this rapid growth, I wanted to provide a little bit of overview regarding some of the disparities that still exist. So we still strive to get more female athletes involved. If you look at the Olympics versus the Paralympics in London, and I don't think, I haven't seen these stats quite available from um, Rio yet, but in London, the Olympic team was about 50-50, whereas the Paralympic team was still lagging a little bit behind that. So it's definitely a goal um, to increase uh, female participation. And I think it's really important to note um, that at both the Olympics and Paralympics, you know, our lens is often of hearing about experiences with the U.S. team, which is a very large delegation. But most of the teams at both games are actually quite small. And if you look, you know, around the world, a, a lot of teams are coming from various regions where their country may have one or two athletes who have qualified. And those athletes will come with one coach or one trainer. And they don't have a lot of um access to services in their home country, not a lot of advice on things like important principles of injury prevention, safe travel, anti-doping rules and regulations, etc. And so then, you know, that becomes an issue and that ends up really falling on us as organizers, both from the IOC and IPC perspective, to ensure that we continue to uphold athlete education as a really important principle of what we do. So also wanted to just share a few exciting photos. I think a, a picture says a thousand words. So this is an image um, from the opening ceremonies of the Paralympics. Um, they had this spectacular countdown to the start of the uh, uh, opening ceremony. And then this athlete um, came down this ramp and threw, threw this zero. So the zero was, uh, of course, the last number of the countdown. And we had fireworks and pyrotechnics, and this guy was flying through the air. And so just, just to say that it is pretty spectacular. And um, opening was certainly something that was very, very special to be a part of and to, to be in the audience. Um, there's always been many, many amazing stories that come out of the games. One of my favorites from the most recent Paralympics was it was the first time in history that there was a independent Paralympic athlete team, which was a, a team of two refugees who don't have a home country, and they were enabled to compete under the Paralympic flag, um, as really as a sign of you know solidarity and goodwill, um, and the, the fact that sport really can be the tool that brings the world together during the period of the Olympics and Paralympics. And of course, with any, you know, elite level event, there's always some politics and some controversies, no matter how much you wish that weren't the case. Um, one of the most well known recently, um, around Rio was, um, was the, the, um, the knowledge that evolved over the summer about, um, systematic doping in Russia and the, you know, very interesting response in that there was a, a disparity in a, in a difference between how how it was handled at the Olympics versus Paralympics, and it just goes to show that although although these events are very much linked in the one bid, one city model, at the end of the day, they are actually governed by different organizations. So kind of a, a brief reminder of that. So just to say a little bit about my role. So I uh, work with the International Paralympic Committee. The IPC is really the parallel organization of the IOC. The IOC is based in Lausanne, Switzerland, and the IPC is based in Germany. 
And, uh, you know, as the IOC is a major event organizer for the Olympics, the IPC is the same for the Paralympics. And as a, as a organization that is, you know, truly at the top echelon of implementing the games, the IPC as well as the IOC have several standing committees of individuals who um, volunteer their time in order to be able to help guide the movement and to help think about how we move forward strategically and in a way that really um, upholds safe sports and, you know, enables athletes to put on the best performance. So after finishing from competing, I initially had an opportunity to be part of the IPC Medical Commission um, initially as an athlete member and then stayed involved and have evolved into now chairing it. And we do a number of interesting things. I thought I'd list just a few here uh, to provide a, a little bit of a sampling. Um, we overview medical services at the game. So from the standpoint of working with the event organizer, we um, on the medical commission were, were a group of eight physicians from all world regions. And we actually don't provide hands-on care at the game. So we aren't licensed to practice uh, for that period of time in Brazil or, you know, for the same in London or in Tokyo in 2020, but rather we're there more so um, from an administrative standpoint and making sure that things are coming off in a, in a way that, that um, the athletes are getting the best services possible at the game. So we are, our major presence is in the village as well as at the venues and liaising with the organizing committee positions as well as the team medical staff um, and international federation medical staff to make sure that everything is going okay and that the athletes are getting the care they need. One of the things that we do as well is review the um, therapeutic use exemption. So as Dr. Cruz noted, um, as part of the anti-doping program, athletes can apply if they, if they need to use a medication that's otherwise on the prohibited list, but it's something that's required um, or something that they need in order to maintain their own health, then they can apply for what's called a TUE. And during games time, we act as the, uh, the review um, for those TUEs and whether or not they can be approved or not um, uh, in real time. The injury, we also take part in, a, in, in some amount of research at the games, and one of the projects that we've been moving forward for the past several years is something called the Injury and Illness Surveillance Study, and this is um, really a, a system through which we monitor the injuries and illnesses that are occurring at the games. Um, it's quite innovative, it's very exciting, and it mostly runs for a web-based platform through which um, team physicians, federation physicians, as well as uh, folks working for the organizing committee um, log what they're seeing from a clinical standpoint so that we can keep track of, you know, what types of injuries and what types of illnesses are most commonly being treated at the game. Um, one other thing we do that I think is interesting is implementation of a safe sport policy. So to explain a bit more about that, um, from the standpoint of both the Olympic and Paralympic movement, it has been recognized, you know, increasingly so that the higher you go in sport, um, and the more and, and the more you enter into elite levels of competition, athletes are at risk for for abuse and maltreatment and sometimes exploitation by by bad actors either in their home country or through the sport. And as much as we weren't the, as much as we were excuse me as much as we wish that weren't the case, we certainly still see examples of it. So um, with the IOC leading the charge, we've implemented across both games a, a system through which athletes can report. If they feel like they're in danger, they feel like their uh, rights are being violated, um, so that that protections can be put into place, and um, and we can ensure that every every athlete has the opportunity to compete in a, a fair and safe environment. So, although that's not direct clinical care, it is something that we oversee from the standpoint of the um, IPC Medical Commission. So, this is a picture of our team. Um, when you work when you work on a committee at the games, you often get your own uniform. It's not Team USA, but it is something that um, commissioned and what we're asked to wear by the, the IPC. We thought it was pretty funny because we kept being mistaken for Team Netherlands, but we were easy to recognize in a crowd and we could find each other pretty easily with these bright orange polo shirts. Um, this is a, a picture of several of our committee members at the triathlon, um, paratriathlon medical venue um, with several Rio 2016 volunteers as well as Dr. Jacques Rangero, who was the Rio 2016 Chief Medical Officer. He's pictured, he's um, the gentleman in the far right of the image here. Uh, this is a photo in front of the polyclinic. I think Dr. Cruz also had a few pictures here. This is the 
the large clinic that's based within the village that um, provides clinical care, particularly for athletes who don't have their own team physicians available or team medical staff, so a lot of the smaller delegations. And this is also where athletes can go for more advanced imaging studies, um, dental services, ophthalmology services, pharmacy, and several other um, pillars of, of care. Uh, of course, there's plenty of amazing competition. This is one picture from the uh, quad rugby venue um, that shows the sort of wide angle of the venue as well as the uh, image from one of the games. Um, and of course, you could fill a whole presentation just with amazing, amazing pictures of competition, um, but wanted to provide a little snapshot there. We have lots of fun along the way. So um, I had the honor of being able to carry the torch in the torch relay. So this is a picture at about 5.10 in the morning because I had seed number two, <laughs> um, but of course it was a huge, huge honor and a really, really amazing part of the experience of being down there. And we have a lot of fun. Um, this is a picture of, of Tom, the Rio mascot, who we all thought looked somewhat like an artichoke, but um, along the way you're working hard, but also, you know, enjoying enjoying the experience in many ways. Um, so just wanted to, to note that, that there's many, many ways to become involved, particularly for clinicians with expertise in sports medicine. Um, you know, of course, there's uh, the role of team physician to working directly with a country or with a specific sport. Um, when a game, games or a major event comes to your region or country, there's often the opportunity to become involved as a, as a physician for the organizing committee. So, for example, if the games are awarded to Los Angeles in 2024, there'll be a broad call for people to come volunteer their time to work not for Team USA per se, but actually for the organizing committee in which you're involved in the care of all athletes. Um, for example, you might get stationed in the venue medical station at the stadium or at the tennis venue or you know a number of other roles. And that's a, a very exciting way to get involved. Of course, you can work for uh, the sport federation in which you're involved um, broadly across the sport, both either domestically or internationally. Um, there's a strong role for the voice of, of sports medicine physicians in providing policy and oversight, such as what I've described with um, my role with the IPC. Um, physicians are often involved in monitoring of public health at the games. So as you can imagine, if there were to be an outbreak of a communicable disease at the games, that's a big problem, and that would very much impair athletes' ability to um, have their best performance. So there's a large focus that gets put on uh, public health screening and monitoring in that type of environment. And one can get involved in research. There were several physicians at both the Olympics, um, I'm sure, as well as the Paralympics who were there, not to provide clinical care at all, but actually engaging in, in uh, various aspects, aspects of research that are very important for us to know about, you know, what happens, um, the experiences of athletes um, at the Olympics or Paralympics. And I think my advice would be just to, to start to dig in, um, figure out a way to get involved, and of course, Typically, it makes the most sense to start locally and get some experience and then grow from there. And, and really don't limit yourself. If you, you know, try to work in one venue and find some roadblocks or find it difficult to get involved, try another angle and, and don't give up because there are very many ways to contribute um, to the Olympic and Paralympic movement uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Um, in terms of my role with the IPC, I got involved in 2010 and... Um, uh, moved in, uh, into the role of chair in 2014, and we have eight members, as were pictured in the top image there from opening ceremonies, that represent all world regions and with various backgrounds, some primary care sports medicine, some PM&R, and some orthopedics. Um, the bottom image is a picture of a presentation that we were able to give at um, this last year's ACSM in Boston, which is also a fantastic opportunity for education and dissemination. And just a few, a little bit more detail about a few of the things that we do, and then I'll, I'll wrap up and so we can open it up to questions. Um, in terms of the Paralympic Injury and Illness Surveillance Study, um, as was noted, this is really the systematic monitoring of injuries and illnesses, and it's been fantastic because it's provided us a baseline for understanding the epidemiology of injuries in this very unique athlete population. Um, this was initiated in the Winter Games in Salt Lake in 2002 and then was rolled out in London 2012 at the Summer Games. Summer games are a much more complex environment to do research because they're so much bigger um, with several thousand athletes as opposed, as opposed to several hundred athletes. But this is really the start of starting to define injury patterns in the Paralympic athlete population. And once you understand injury patterns, then you can, of course, start to implement um, 
strategies to, to modify uh, risk factors and then and then follow injuries over time so that, of course, the ultimate goal is that you reduce the incidence of injury and illnesses at the game. A little bit more about what we do in terms of uh, TUEs. So all of this is guided by um, the WADA International Standard for Therapeutic Use Exemptions. Um, at the international level, uh, you know, WADA really sets policy in terms of what medications are prohibited, um, how do sports federations as well as national anti-doping authorities implement programs, and inclusive of how you um, overview and either approve or not approve something like TUE. And it's, it's you know, as you could probably imagine, much more complex than you even begin to think um, when first getting involved. But there are some principles that always apply, things like the fact that the, the medication is required and it can't be substituted by a non-prohibited medication, for example, um, that the medication brings the athlete back to their baseline state of health but not beyond, and so on and so forth. So that's a really interesting process that often is, you know, leaves us in, oftentimes leaves us in a gray area of trying to understand a little bit more about uh, what's needed, what's not needed, and how to how to maintain fairness in sport while also enabling athletes to compete uh, fairly if they do require um, specific medication. So into the future, I'm sure that um, Pyeongchang and Tokyo will bring us further progress. And as I said, watch to see what happens in Los Angeles because 2024, many of the people on this webinar may be <laughs> out of training and in practice. And it will be a really exciting time to get involved as young physicians um, in sports medicine, and, and, you know, we all play a part in making sure that that um, athletes are able to compete in a, in a safe environment. So thanks very much, and this is the logo of the IPC as well as the U.S. Paralympic team, and it's been an honor to be involved, and great to join you this evening. Great. Thank you, thank you Dr. Arkad, uh, Dr. Arkad, for sharing your perspective and insight on your experiences both uh, with the Olympics and the Paralympic Games. At this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions that the attendings may have, and I bet you think the best way to do it is to just type in your questions into the chat, and uh, we can go ahead and ask those questions. Um, I guess I'll start out. Um, thank you both for sharing such great presentations. Dr. Balwet kind of spoke to this, but I was wondering if you could speak a little more, uh, Dr. Cruz or Dr. Balwet, on how um, you got involved with the Olympic or Paralympic Games and kind of the uh, path that you both took into the roles that you have now. Um, that'd be great. So I guess um, I can I can start. Um, I think a lot of us kind of get started through the, your own personal experiences um, and and maybe athletic experiences. Uh, for me personally, as as mentioned in the introduction, I I was a gymnast myself. Um, typically, you know, like most gymnasts start at a very young age and, and went up through, uh, collegiate and then basically train and, and compete with the national team for three years, uh, after college. Um, and then it was basically training for the 2000 Olympic Games. Uh, I got hurt, uh, a week before Olympic trials, so I wasn't able to compete Olympic trials, but then three weeks later found myself in medical school. It made a made a quick transition, and then really from there, I think a lot of us just really appreciate the opportunity to stay involved with their their sport or their athletic um, you know uh, relationships. And so I just immediately contacted USA Gymnastics to see if I could start volunteering. And really from the the point that I started medical school in uh, 2000 till all the way up through residency. Um, I volunteered with USA Gymnastics just at various uh, domestic events and, you know, whether it was folding towels or filling out uh, forms or, um, you know, eventually kind of working your way up and getting more experience. And then once I finished a fellowship in 2007, um, 2008, uh, I came on more officially as part of the medical staff and then shortly thereafter took over as a men's team doc. And then just kind of grew from there. And then during this last quad, I just took on a little bit more of an active role um, with with all of our disciplines with USA Gymnastics and then led up to various uh, international uh, competition coverage and then eventually to the Olympic Games. So it's kind of a process. And like uh, Dr. Bio was pointing out, you know, you kind of start start out willing to do whatever is, is needed just to kind of do your part and be part of the team and, and, and uh and get involved and 
and look for those uh, various opportunities. Um, for me personally, I was just fortunate to already have some relationships in the sport having been involved. And so, you know, um, I, I feel, felt blessed uh, for, for that and, um, and just kind of grew the, the opportunity from there. Yeah, and I would second that. I, I um, in the talk, talked a little bit about how I got involved, but really it was it was very similar to, to Dr. Cruz. I um, had been competing, and once I finished my competitive career, I knew, you know, that I still had the passion to be involved. And honestly, at that point, I was I was happy to be involved in whatever way would just keep me a part of it and, and keep me in the you know in the loop to be able to interact with athletes. So um, when I first uh, became involved with the medical committee, I was definitely definitely the low man on the totem pole and was just there to assist in whatever way possible and and dig in and help out with various projects. Um, and then you know that involved in order you know in, to being able to be more involved in leadership, but it was definitely just slow, steady progress and and being willing to volunteer time and and um, contribute in whatever way you know, helped out the committee to, to make progress. Um, I would say that I think, um, you know, at this point, I, you know, a lot of it comes down to a lot of this work happens uh, on the weekends and in the evenings. A lot of it is tacked on to what you already do or what we already do um, and I guess what you could call our day jobs. And, you know, it's really that passion that brings us to be able to be involved and, to contribute and kind of do whatever it takes to be able to interact and work with these amazing athletes. So it's not it's not always glamorous by any means, but with a lot of hard work and dedication, then sometimes you can find yourself at, at some place like the Olympic or Paralympic Games. Um, so a lot of a lot of forces at play, but it all comes down to being you know being willing to contribute um, along the way. Great, thanks. Um, and as a follow up, one of our attendees has a question and is just wondering. How competitive is it to become an elite team physician or to become a physician at this level? Um, well, I mean, uh, it's it's certainly competitive. You know, I mean, there's there's um, a lot of very very good and talented and uh, you know sports medicine physicians out there that uh, can offer a lot. And um, only so many opportunities with NGBs and with with the Olympic committees. Um, so you know, and we we always keep that in mind along the way that uh, that it can be competitive. I think there are ways to just start small and start looking at how you can get that exposure and not keeping them. I think if you keep in mind the end game, uh, it, it can be, it can be very daunting. You know, and so Dr. Blauet kind of mentioned that, you know, you don't you don't go into it with the end goal in mind of wanting to go to the Olympic Games necessarily. You go into it with just the the initial short term goal of being involved and being in that atmosphere and having a passion for it and looking forward to it. And then if it if it grows from there, it grows. And if not, you're just thankful for the opportunity you have along the way. So I think it can, it can seem a little bit daunting to think about being a team doc at the Olympics, but you, you kind of start small and, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that I have a lot to add. I would say the same. Um, I think the only other thing I would add would be to, to keep your mind open, um, particularly as a student and then resident and then eventually as a fellow and then an attending or faculty member, to keep your mind open to, to getting involved in various ways. So so everyone, you know, I think often we have the ultimate goal of being involved as a team position, but getting involved in, in various facets of either the Olympic or Paralympic movement can actually help create the connections and knowledge of the environment and relationships that then simply people get to know who you are so that then when you're ready to be a team position, you're more likely to have success in that. So you know, at this point as a, as a medical student or trainee, it might be, you know, writing a review or getting involved in research to some extent um, within a sport. And maybe you're not providing direct clinical care, but you're starting to, to gain knowledge of um, Olympic and Paralympic sport more generally and um, creating, creating that network of people who can support you to your goal. Great. Thanks. 
Um, we have another question from an attendee. Uh, they just want to know, you know, given your obligations as a physician, working in your clinic or at the hospital, um, how difficult was it to attend the Olympic or Paralympic Games and kind of, I guess, achieving that balance between uh, your work and um, your role as the uh, within the Olympics and the Paralympics? I think that's, that's a great question. Um, Sherry, if you figure it out, please let me know. Yeah, not really. <laughs> that's, a, that's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge, you know, but I think uh, that's where the passion comes in, you know, but I guess the way that I just um, in a concrete way justify it is the fact that, you know, when I cover games or when I'm in the training room, maybe later than anticipated, you know, that's kind of my on call. You know, I, I as a non-operative doc, I don't go to the hospital. I don't do surgery. I don't do hospital rounds, you know, and so my, my on call, my after hours is covering a sport event. You know, it could be could be worse. So I kind of justify it that way. You know, the life of a of a physician in general is is uh, is, is is definitely an extended role. You know, I think if if you just talk to any you know family doc out there, they're charting you know 10 o'clock at night. So it's just a way of of how you can find that personal life balance. A lot of us that go into sports medicine that have that athletic background, it is very important to us personally to maintain that balance, and that has to be a priority from from the, the the first moment on because you can't easily get sucked into doing a lot of different things and so it has to be a priority you know work um, work certainly is important to get you where you want to be professionally but family uh, exercise um, all those things um, that you normally have for personal balance is important and then picking and choosing you know because there are a lot of opportunities along the way and and um keeping in mind that you don't have to say yes to every single thing and and uh you just do a good job and with what you who you do choose to do and, and try to find that balance best you can but it's a challenge it's uh it's always it, it, it's always something that you're working on no matter what point you are in your training or your professional career mm -hmm. yeah I, I i couldn't agree more um a lot of this stems out of um our passion to be involved um, with the movement and to continue to be around these athletes and working with these athletes. Um, I guess the only, I would also add that um, there are, so it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, an interesting, an interesting endeavor to, to work, to be away for that type of extended period of time once you have an active practice. And some of the tricks that I've found that are helpful are, you know, working with, um, my institution um, team from several from several different facets. So, for example, prior to going to the games, um, sat down and met with our marketing and communications team and talked about. You know, they were obviously super excited that that one of their physicians that I was going and being able to work with them to do some blogging while I was there, or take plenty of good pictures and give a grand rounds upon return. You know, those types of little. Um, I guess you could say kind of bi-directional favors help out because, you know, most institutions are extremely proud to have a position at the games. It's something that, that institutions can really, um, in many ways brag about. And I mean that in a really positive sense. And so I think having the goodwill, um, and the support to be able to take that extended period away is it's a two-way street and working with, um, the people who, you know, are going to be covering for you. Um, your, you know, if it's a chief or chair of the department, the people who are ultimately your boss and supervisors as a physician, really, really good to figure out how to give back as well so that even though people are, are working hard to cover you while you're away, um, everyone is mutually benefiting at least a little bit. Um, and that keeps it exciting for everybody. Yeah, I would, I would, um, just add that too, that, you know, being away from your practice for, Essentially, four weeks is is certainly a challenge. It's uh, very busy beforehand, uh, trying to get everybody in that you need to see and and, and prepare the staff for when you're going to be gone. But it can certainly um, be be very very busy when you get back to. But I did similar things, you know, with marketing and with the, the partners in the practice. And I, I'm fortunate to be part of a, a big multi specialty ortho group that has. Um, six sports orthopedists, um, some of which have done prior NGB and Olympic coverage. So 
so mm-hmm. that that knowledge is there in terms of how important that can be for for somebody to to do and the passion and so there was a lot I, I'm fortunate to have a lot of support within my group uh, to do what I do and then just from a practical standpoint you know when I signed a contract um, you know a, a number of years ago part of that contract was my my travel with USA Gymnastics, you know, because that was something that was really important to me to have that opportunity. And so um, you know, I made sure to be able to secure that, you know, just from a practical standpoint and in, in, in negotiating my my role with the group. So um, there's various ways to approach it, though. Yeah, I would agree. I, did, I actually did the same. So if um, if when you're moving into a, a, a role as an a, attending physician, if you know it's something that's of interest to you, it's, it's a great practical tip to keep it in mind when you're thinking about how your contract looks. A little ways down the road, um, mm-hmm. if, if, if you're currently in medical school, but just those little pearls that help along the way. Great. Uh, thanks both for your responses. It looks like that's it for the question. So, um, I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Blauet and Dr. Cruz, for taking the time to uh, share their experiences with us. I'd also like to thank the attendings who were able to view our webinar live and for providing their questions. Um, I'd like to remind them that this webinar will be available online as well as a recording. And for those of you who are watching the recording and weren't able to join us live, if you have any questions or want to know more about the AMSSN Medical Student Interest Group, you can always send us an email at amssm underscore msig at amssm.org. Um, and this concludes our presentation and webinar. Thank you both again for taking the time to uh, share your experience with us. Thank you. Thanks.